welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today um, to discuss about um, how to deposit data with the UK Data Service. This is a, this is a short webinar. Um, it's just one hour long compared to our workshops that are one hour and a half. But we hope they're going to give you the knowledge you need to understand how to deposit with the data service, but also what the benefits of depositing with the data service are. So my name is Christina Madra. I'm the Data Collections Development Manager at the UK Data Service. Um, I lead on the acquisition and negotiations of new data for um, the UK Data Service. And I'm joined today by my colleague Suka Dogan as well, Senior Collections um, Development Officer. And again, we work together to ensure that we acquire the data that's most needed to our um, research community in the social sciences. Um, before we go into the content of today's webinar, let's do a, a little slide, a little slide, a little menti. Uh, so if you join um, at menti.com, you can use the code 17255921, or you can scan the QR code on the screen just with your phone, turn on your um, camera and scan the code. We're just interested to find out what types of data do you produce or provide support for. So um, we have a couple of responses, transcripts, surveys, derived variables, cross-sectional, longitudinal, exactly what we were after. We can see what a variety of data you are working, producing and providing support for. You can see transcripts are coming quite a lot, survey data as well questionnaires, focus groups, so again, more qualitative data. That is fantastic, and this is all data that we can accept at the UK Data Service to make available for um, future reuse. I have another question for you with the same code, so you just only have to refresh the page. Which of the following best describes your primary affiliation? Um, so your primary, we know some people work in, um, in multiple sectors, but do you identify with education or academia, government, either central or lo local, non-departmental public bodies, so for example, the NHS um, or UKSA, not-for-profit or NGOs, commercial or business or any other? Education and academia is in the lead, and we have one other as well. Um, that's fantastic. And one final question for the introduction. Have you ever shared data for future reuse? Yes or no? Are you just starting your journey? Yes, we can see a, a quite a few people just starting their journey, but also quite a few people that have already shared their data for future reuse. I am most grateful to, to everyone for, for participating in the Menti. It's just nice to know um, who we're chatting with. And again, any questions, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, but we also do bespoke Zoom calls or phone calls, Teams calls, whatever is most, uh, most suitable for you. So today we are going to be looking at a brief overview of UK Data Service, who we are, what do we do, what do we have, who are our data users and who are our data providers. Also looking at our collections development policy and the different repositories we offer, depending on the data that is to be made available. How do you actually deposit with UK Data Service? And both processes, no matter the repository, are fully online. And I'm going to do a short live demo on that. What are the requirements and best practices for depositing with UK Data Service? So here we're talking about how to prepare the files, how to prepare the documentation. Also an overview of the benefits of depositing with us. And finally, a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So let's delve into the UK Data Service Overview. Um, we host the largest collection of social, economic and population research data. And it's not only about providing access to this data, but it's providing support, guidance and training to both data users and data producers to ensure high quality social and economic research and education. UK Data Service is a partnership between UK Data Archive at University of Essex. So both um, Sue and myself are based at UK Data Archive, but we also have 
colleagues at Katie Marsh Institute for Social Research at the University of Manchester. They are focusing on data literacy, colleagues at GISC focusing on impact in macro data, Edina, University of Edinburgh, and also colleagues at University College London that are focusing on census data. Of course, besides supporting data users and data producers, we also support the development of best practices for data preservation and sharing standards. And we work very closely with other social science archives and other repositories to ensure that data is shared fairly. A few stats about UK data service. We have a over now 9,600 data collections in our repositories and we make available around 250 new data collections and new editions each year. We have approximately 48,000 registered users and they account for 130,000 data accesses worldwide per year. Now to put a little bit in practice the numbers because sometimes you look at the numbers and it's like oh fantastic what does that mean? In reality, that means the collection from UKDS is accessed every six minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So we can see there's a lot of usage in terms of the data that we host. In terms of data users, so who actually makes use of the data? We have academic researchers and students, and we've seen today a lot of the participants are from academia. We have government analysts researchers from charities and foundations, business consultants and data analysts, but also independent researchers and think tanks. In terms of data depositors, we have data from UK government departments, so for example, Department for Transport. We have national statistical authorities. UK Data Service has a concord at the Memorandum of Understanding with the Office for National Statistics, allowing us to make available for future reuse a wide variety of survey governmental data under different access levels, and we are covering access, level, access levels in a little bit. We also have several data collections from research institutes, so our colleagues in the Institute for Social and Economic Research at University of Essex that are creating Understanding Society. They make the data available via UK Data Service, but we have also the Center for Longitudinal Studies, cohort studies as well. And also data from academic and individual researchers, either funded or no funded. As long as it's within Dreamit, we can accept that data and make it available for future reuse. So let's have a look about uh, at our collections development policy in the repositories we offer and what I'm on about this, is it in Remit or not? So we are a domain specific repository for social sciences. This is why sometimes we might not be able to accept data in our collection, but we always liaise with data producers in trying to find an alternative place for deposit if that is the case. We have a clear and transparent appraisal process and we have a data appraisal group that ensures we acquire data that is within Dreamit, so social sciences data, to ensure that our research community can make use of the data, but also that data providers can make the data available to those that will, will use it in their research. So a couple of examples of disciplines in Remit, we're talking about economic and social history, management and business studies, psychology, sociology, social policy, all of these are within the, the Remit of UK Data Service. We do work very closely with DSRC, we are funded by DSRC, and we work very closely with them. And one of our main aims is to ensure that the ESRC research data policy is maximized. And of course, we appreciate the need for um, cross domain um, research. Um, so again, these are just a couple of examples. You are always welcome to get in touch with us if you're not sure whether we can accept or cannot accept the data. We're always happy to discuss and support you. UK Data Service repositories um, to enable access to as much data as possible. We have two separate repositories, the curated repository, which is most suitable for large scale in population representative data. And our curated repository contains large governmental surveys, so annual population survey, the crime survey, 
um, the health surveys, England, Scotland, also longitudinal data such as the Understanding Society or the Center for Longitudinal Data cohorts. And I've put in there a link, and again, all the slides will be made available that provides information about our key um, data depositors for the curated collection. We also have the richer repository, which is suitable for smaller scale data um, and experimental data. While Risher has originally been funded to host EFRC funded data, again, going back to the EFRC research data policy, um, it currently hosts data funded by a various number of research councils, either from UKRI or outside of UKRI, but also other non-funded data. As long as it covers the disciplines we have discussed and it, we can make a, an appraisal and make an informed decision that our research community, social scientists, will be able to make use of the data and you as a data producer are going to get the usage by sharing the data with UK Data Service, we can accept that data in our collection. How do you actually deposit with UK Data Service? So firstly, we have a couple of slides and then I'm doing a live demo, which hopefully the technology is not going to fail me. Um, so the first step is to create an account. Um, and I've included in there our FAQs around registering an account. If you are based at an academic institution, and we've seen most of the people joining us today are, you can simply use your university credentials. You will still have to sign our legally binding end user license agreement, um, but and complete the registration details. Um, but you do not need to have any other checks in place. For anyone else, you can request an account with us um, and we issue credentials, but our colleagues in the health desk team are doing additional checks just to make sure that the people that are creating the account are saying, um, they are correctly. The next step is choosing a repository. So are you looking at depositing data that is population representative? You can deposit in our curated repository. Are you looking at depositing smaller scale data or some experimental data that you've created? Then you can deposit in our VISHA repository. Again, I can't stress enough, if in doubt, do reach out to us at collections at ukdataservice.ac.uk and we can help you with that decision. And again, we can set up Zooms or Teams or phone calls as needed. We do provide repository specific guidance. Um, both repositories are fully online in terms of the deposit process. You do not have to sign anything on paper or send us, for example, a, a scan copy of anything by no means. And we have a guide for depositing data in our curated collection and also a video for depositing data in our um, reshare um, repository. So let's do our live demo. And this is where we have to start sharing our screen and hope that everything goes well. So I am now logging into my UK data service account. As I've mentioned, if you are registered with a university, you can just use your university credentials. Um, we are based at the University of Essex. So I'm just using my University of Essex credentials to log into my account. Your account also provides the opportunity to use data from UK Data Service. You would add it into your account and make use of the data. As we can see, you can create projects as well. And again, we have videos around how to, how to use data and also an event covering how to access data. Now we are focusing on deposits. We just need to hover over the deposits, click on it, and we can see we have three options here, data set, licenses, and reshare repository. Say, for example, your data is population representative and you would like to deposit with UK Data Service, all you have to do at the first stage is offer a new data set. So in here, I place on offer a new data set, and this is what we call uh, an offer form. It contains very minimal metadata that allows us to take an informed decision on whether to accept the data in our curated collection, to actually refer it to our research repository, or to have a discussion around alternative places for deposit. So we have tried to provide a lot of information in terms of how the form should be completed. And to bear in mind, for security purposes, you will be logged out after 20 minutes. 
So it's very important while you are completing the form to use the save button right at the end of the of the of the screen. It doesn't submit it when you press save, it just saves it for you in your account so you can come back later. Um, and again, the 20 minutes are for security purposes to ensure that we abide by our ISO accreditation. So let's have a look at what do we need to complete. So we have a title, a short title, it needs to reflect the nature and the subject of the data collection. And to bear in mind, we may amend the title to make sure that it matches our cataloging standards, Usually by this, we mean adding a year at the end. Some data producers forget to add the year at the end um, and also making sure that the title is in title case, not sentence case. So I'm just going to insert in here, for example, um, survey of children with pets 2024. I do love pets. This is the first thing that came to mind. Um, and then we have to provide an abstract for our collection. So when we're saying an abstract, think of it as a short article. It doesn't have to be long by any means. Around 300 words are enough. Describing what the general aims of the collections were, what the purpose and the background around how the data was collected. So we're including that information in here. Has there been any funding? So for example, have you been funded by the ESRC? Have you been funded by the MRC? If that is the case in here, you just need to type in the funder and then insert the grant number, yes, and the grant number for your collection. If your data is highly sensitive, and again, during the, the webinar, we are going to the this levels, uh, to ensure that, that we understand what we're referring to personal data or sensitive data, then controlled access to that data is needed. To bear in mind, if, if controlled data is needed, you will have to have a legal gateway under which data can be accessed. So how are you sharing that data? Under data protection legislation, you must identify an applicable legal gateway to share that data for future reuse. Is it, for example, public task? Um, in the UK, most data is collected from universities and public bodies, is collected under public task, um, and sharing of that data can happen under public task as long as an act is identified Pardon me. So, for example, the Education Act, Social Care Act, those allow sharing of the data. Or for government bodies, we have the Digital Economy Act that sets a framework on how personal data can be shared for future reuse. If it is controlled access, we do require some additional information from you regarding the data protection officer, their email in the in the legal gateway. Um, of course, with the changes to the legislation, there is a bill that's currently on hold. Um, the data protection officer might change um, its name and its legal status. So there might be changes then and um, we are going to, to apply those as needed. Contacts, and I can't stress how important it is to make sure that the contacts are provided in full. So who are the data creators? And think of the data creators as the authors, as we would think, for example, with a book. So who are actually the authors of the data collection? Who are the copyright holders of the data collection? Sometimes they are the data creators, the data authors. Sometimes copyright holders might actually be the institutions because it depends on the employment um, contract that you have in place. It might be the funders in some cases, they might actually claim um, copyright on the data that you're creating. Again, if you are unsure, please do get in touch. We are here to help with those types of, of, of queries. You are not alone, is what I'm trying to say. If, for example, you require access to be only made available under permission only, so a data access committee needs to be in place to provide permission to access the data. We do require the data access committee details and the data access committee email address as well. We do prefer a shared mailbox just to make sure if, say, for example, the person that leads on this goes on holiday, there's someone else that can that can pick up the, the access request. 
Then at the offer stage, we gather a little bit of information about the coverage of the collection. So all of these are controlled vocabulary. So as I start to write, I can see them being populated, United Kingdom, regions. I can type in here Essex and we can see Essex. Um, they might not be applicable. You might just have the country. Um, regions might be all of the regions in the UK. That is perfectly fine. You do not have to complete the regions, the towns, or other geographies that if that is not applicable. Population, providing us with information about the characteristics of the of the population of your study. So, for example, I have a survey. What did we say? Children with pets. Survey of. 3,000 children that have pets and live in private households in the United Kingdom. For example, that would be what we can put in here. Very important, the consent confidentiality and disclosure restriction, we really need to ensure, and here we're making the difference between, we've talked a bit earlier about personal data and legal gateways, and we do have um, workshops that go much more in depth around those concepts. So please do make sure you have a look at our events page if you're interested in delving deeper into that. When we're talking about consent, we are not talking about consent from a, a legal basis. It might be applicable and that is perfectly fine, but we are talking about consent from an ethical point of view. Participants should be told what happens with their data once it's been collected. They need to be informed and that's our ethical duty as researchers to inform them about that. So for example, in here, you could provide information that in the participant information sheet, participants have been told that anonymized data will be shared via a responsible repository for future research. What we ask from you is making sure that you do send either the participant information sheet, blank copies of the consent form, so the template consent form. We do not require the signed ones, those are personal data, but we do require evidence that the ethical sharing of data is possible. Anonymization. How did you anonymize the data? So, for example, have you used banding techniques, recording techniques, removing all of the direct identifiers, of course, so there's no names, addresses, and so on. And then providing a little information about disclosure risk. Are there any sensitivities in the data? Um, are there any problems in terms of variables that you were not sure? So, for example, you might say I have top coded age um, at 80, but I'm not sure whether it would have been better to actually band it rather than top coded. This is something that we can help with. You can always include that information in here. If you have references and publications, please do make sure to include them in the offer form and in the deposit form, which we're going to see a bit later on. And finally, the file description. So what type of data are you depositing? So here it might be, for example, in my case, I've said it's a survey. Say I have three STATA files, three or STATA files, 300 megabytes, and then description of documentation. What type of documentation are you uploading? Well, I have a user guide as a PDF. I have a technical guide as a PDF, and I have the questionnaires as a PDF. So here we would be providing all of that information. As we only have one hour, um, what I have done, I've already prepared um, a collection. So if I go to my data sets, I can already see I have the introduction to depositing data with UK Data Service um, because it, it's just easier when time is so short. Um, once you submit your collection, and I'm going to share my screen, you will get an automated um, email from us saying, Thank you for submitting the data offer. We will make an assessment based on our selection and appraisal criteria um, in explaining our decision. If your collection is accepted for our curated collection, you will then get a second email saying we have completed our review and we are pleased to inform you that the data collection has been accepted in the curated repository. If it has been accepted in the curated repository, there are two additional steps, and that is the license component and the deposit form. The license is the agreement between you as the data 
producer as the data owner and us as the data service provider to be able to disseminate that data. We encourage all data producers to read our license agreement in depth. Any questions, once again, please do reach out. Um, you are not alone. Um, you can ask us any questions about the license agreement and tell us about the access conditions you would like to apply for the data. So, for example, you've anonymized the data, it's highly unreasonably likely to identify someone. However, you would want an extra protection. That means the data can be made available under safeguarded access. And again, we're talking about the access levels in a little bit in a bit more detail. So this is telling us how would you like that data made available? Is commercial use permitted, for example, or would you like no commercial use? Would you like an open license? Say, for example, all of your data is aggregate data and you would like to make it available under a Creative Commons license or from the government under the, an open government license and so on. It's also really important, if you haven't specified it in the author form, to specify all the copyright holders that are applicable to your data collection. Um, sometimes it happens and in the author form, um, we forget to complete the, the copyright holders. That's not a problem. Just send us an email back when you're, when you're asking us about what access conditions you would like, just specifying the copyright holders applicable are X, Y, and Z. Now, I need to do yet another share and I am going back to my deposit form. So you have received the email about making sure you complete and submit the deposit form. Let us know about the license. We're going to create the license for you. Um, key consideration, we cannot accept any materials until the license is in place because that is the document that allows us to process and disseminate that data. So until the license is in place, we cannot accept materials in our collection. So we can now edit and submit our deposit form. Again, the 20 minutes of the inactivity still apply. Um, so if you are inactive, do make sure you save the form before going, for example, for a, for a coffee break or for lunch. What is the difference between the offer and deposit form? The deposit form has additional catalog metadata elements. So we want to find out more about the main topics covered in the study. Everything else remained the same in terms of the context that we've provided, the coverage that we've provided, but we also need more information about spatial units. So do you have any geographical identifiers in your data? For example, that could be regions. And again, this is Again, a uh, controlled vocabulary, you just have to select whichever one they apply. So we just have standard government office regions or as known nowadays regions. What are the subject categories that apply to your data? And again, this is a, a controlled vocabulary as we call it. You have to select what are the subject categories, for example, consumer behavior, what are the dates of fieldwork in the time period if they're different? So, for example, you might do historical research. Um, so you might do the research now, but the time period is actually 1850 to 1860. If that is the case, do make sure you complete both the dates of fieldwork in the time period. What is the time dimension? And we've seen in the in the very first menti we have um, a variety of, of, of um, data that is being produced or provided support for from cross-sectional to longitudinal time series is a repeat, repeated cross-sectional study. So again, selected which of the time dimension applies. Again, making sure if you forgot anything about the consent confidentiality and disclosure risk you can still add information otherwise it comes from the from the offer form we have additional methodology information that we do require in the deposit form how many variables are present in the data how many units so how many participants do you have in the data what is the type of unit so what type of participants did you have was it individuals was it institutions was it text units so you've used documents for example for secondary data analysis 
where are the participants located, cross-national, national, or sub-national, what are the methods of data collection, and again, we have to select the ones that are, are applicable, uh, multiple can be applicable, that's perfectly fine, you can add more in here. What was the sampling procedure that you have used? And again, any questions around this, please do get in touch with us. And whether weighting applies, do you have weighting information in your data applicable for um, quantitative survey data or um, is not applicable or no, no weighting has been used? The risk remains the same, and we also have, if you have done digitization or transcription, providing further details about the process, have you used, for example, a template, could we obtain the template from you as well? Um, if you have used existing resources, making sure that you include here what type of um, sources you have used, and also the location and the type of access for those resources. So are all of the resources published under an open license? It is to ensure that copyright clearance is in place. Once we are happy with the deposit form, we can just submit it. The other step is the license. And again, absolutely everything is online. We just go into our licenses. We can review the license text and we can sign it directly via our account. As I said, with technology now, it doesn't want to load the license. Um, it loaded. Uh, I am most happy about that. Um, so we can see we've declared the copyright is Crown Copyright. Um, this is applicable for Crown Bodies. Um, you can read the license agreement in here. Um, you can also download the license agreement as a PDF. If, for example, someone else in your organization needs to review the license agreement, that is the easiest way to do. And then you can sign the license. Um, we do not require only the owner of the copyright and IPR. You can be the joint owner or you can actually be authorized on behalf of the copyright holders to sign the license. Most of our data depositors are not the owner of the copyright and associated IPR, and they be sign on behalf of every data owner in the collection. Now, let's have a brief look at ReShare as well. You have some smaller scale data, some experimental data that you've created. If I click on ReShare repository, I can now create a new data collection. Again, ReShare is very user friendly in terms of providing tips on how to actually complete the collection, upload the data files, what are the formats needed, what is the documentation needed. So I'm going to create a new data collection. You first have to agree to the deposit terms and conditions, and you can see them by clicking the link. Um, you can provide information about your grant details, um, and if this is funded under a UKRI grant, um, so be it ESRC, MRC, AHRC, information from Gateway to Research can populate, but only this original grant details page. So it's going to provide the project title, the project description, the sponsor of the data, and also the different grant holders that apply um, for the collection. To bear in mind is UKRI Gateway to Research, the connection is made via an API, and sometimes that API does fail. Um, if that is the case, just get in touch with us. We can copy the information for you. Um, you can also copy the information yourself, um, but we can we can do that. We can do that for you. Then we have to complete the people section. So again, we can go onto the question marks to understand what are data creators. Creators will become the authors of the data collection. So exactly as we were talking for the curated collection, declaring the right owners who actually own the rights, who is the contact for the data collection, and also if there are any applicable contributors, is there anyone else you would like to acknowledge? Very similar with the curated collection, but here we do not separate an offer in a deposit form, they're all together. We are now providing um, key catalog metadata about our collection. What is the title? And we follow the same um, style as in the curated collection. Is there an alternative title? For example, if your research is funded via an ESRC center, you might provide as the alternative title the ESRC center that has funded your research for further discoverability. The abstract 
The same is just a short article, motivation for the study, aims, and topics. We need to include keywords in research, and these are, and in the slides I have provided a link to have it. Um, this comes from our electronic, 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 electronic thesaurus. Um, so for example, children, I'm going back to my, my children with pets, we can see how many different, um, children indexes are in there we can add at that we can add for example leisure we can see again we can have a look what is available leisure time or maybe it was leisure time activities and um, we advise data and depositors to have at least six seven keywords for the data collection because it does um allow for further discoverability. The topic classification, so easier data about economics, health, history. You can just add, um, we advise no more than three, four to be added as a maximum. What are the key um, topics that are covered in your collection? Very similar, we have the collection period and the temporal coverage. The same is applicable if you are using historical data, making sure that you've provided the when you've actually done the, the work, but also what the collection is covering, um, if it is historical data. Are there geographical areas? Um, so for example, you might have collected data just in Essex. That is not very applicable and to bear in mind that does in increase the disclosure risk. Um, so sometimes some information need to be refrained from providing because we do not want to compromise the identity of the participants. Again, providing the country, United Kingdom or any other country, you can start typing in France, for example, and so on. Um, you can add as many um, rows as necessary. Are there any spatial units? So again, here we're talking about geographical identifiers. We can have a look and we have different types of spatial units applicable. And again, just clicking on add, it adds you to your catalog metadata. We also collect information, same as for the curated, around the methodology. So what was the data collection method? And again, we can use the question marks to try to find out what is the type of information that we are expecting. So in a few sentences, briefly describe the methodology used to create this data collection and describe the study population and the sampling procedure used. Most of the time when we have to go back to data depositors is because this information has not been completed in depth and we are unable to conduct our review or make the data available. Again, as we've seen in the curated one, what is the observation unit? Is it an individual? Is it a family? Is it a household? What is the kind of data that you are depositing? Is there any information about data sourcing, processing, and preparation? Very applicable if you are using already published data. So it's important to include that in here um, and make sure we're going to see when we discuss documentation that we do need a variable log that defines describes from where the data has been used. What are the types of data? The type of data that you are depositing, is it cohort, is it experimental data, is it historical data? Um, and also what is the language of the, of the resource? Is the data in English, is the data in German, in French? Uh, we do accept data in other languages. Um, the only consideration there is if there is no one at the service able to have a look at that data because they do not know the language, you will have to give further reassurances that no personal data is included if that is, is not possible, which is mostly the case. Also, we have related resources where you can include, for example, any publications you have made, a project website, and so on. Once we are happy with the metadata that we've completed in our, in our form, we can upload the information that includes the data in the documentation. And again, probably the second reason we have to return records is because there is no documentation with the data. We just have a CSV or an SPSS or some transcripts, but we don't have any contextual information. And finally, once that is done, you can deposit the collection. Um, Richel will prompt you with different errors telling you, you haven't filled out data creators, you haven't filled out right owners. 
So it's trying to help you as much as possible to, to, to make sure that the metadata is completed in detail. Now, swapping my screen again, and we can go into requirements and best practices for depositing with UK Data Service now that we've seen how the repositories work. What do we expect in terms of the files that are being uploaded? So there are three main considerations. Um, make sure that you do allow sufficient time, not only during the project, but towards your pro towards the end of the project as well, to ensure that you have time to prepare the data in the documentation as well. Making sure you have quality control checks, not only at the data capture, but also at the cleaning process. And finally, prepare supporting documentation, because without supporting documentation, you might have some fantastic data. Um, say, for example, you have a survey that's extremely well labeled. Without having that contextual information, what were the aims of the survey? How was the data collected? we are still unable to use that information correctly. So familiarizing yourself with the three-tier license and access framework we make available at the UK Data Service, um, and I pointed to this a couple of times. Uh, so we have open, safeguarded, and controlled data. We are very keen on data being assessed based on the granularity of the information and the sensitivity of the information. Open data is suitable for data that are not classified as personal data or personal information. There is no residual risk of disclosure in there or where consent to share personal data has um, have been um, collected and is in place. That usually applies, for example, for qualitative data with public figures. Um, we have a couple of collections where they were really keen to make sure that everything remains as was collected. They're happy for that data to be made available. Safeguarded data, again, we're not talking about personal data or personal information. The data has been treated. So as we were going through the forms, I was saying we might ban or we might recode. So again, all the anonymization techniques are in place. But where there might be a slight risk of re-identification in terms of it's still reasonably unlikely to identify an individual, but you want to ensure that that risk is further mitigated. This is where ICO included the effective anonymization technique, where you can add additional safeguards in place. So for example, you are adding an end user license, so all the use of that data must be according to the terms and conditions. You can add, for example, permission only access if needed as well. So you want to vet the projects that they want to use the data for. Finally, we have control data, and this is suitable for data classified as personal data or personal information or data that's particularly sensitive commercially or otherwise. And access is facilitated through the five SAFEs framework. And here we have safe data. All the data has been de-identified. There are no direct identifiers in the data, but the risk of disclosure is high because all of the socio-demographics have been um, retained almost as they have been collected. Some of them have still have to, to have been deleted. We have safe projects. All the projects need to be approved by the data owner before being able to access and use the data. We have safe people. All the people need to be trained um, and need to pass a training. It sounds um, more scary than it is. If you do the training, it's really easy to pass the exam at the end. We have a safe environment. Um, so all the data is made available just in the UK Data Service Secure Lab. You cannot take the data out. You can only take outputs out. So, for example, you might take your regression coefficients and your tables that you've produced for those for those coefficients, for example. But you can't take the individual data out. And finally, we have the safe outputs. All of the outputs are checked for secondary disclosure to ensure that the dis that the individual cannot be identified from the published tables. So again, here we're talking about very granular detailed data, personal data or personal information if it is about an organization. So how do we prepare the files? Just a couple of considerations. And again, I've included links in the slides that I hope they are coming of use. Um, so making sure you have consistent and meaningful file names when you send it to us, we understand um, what, the, what the files are. 
ensuring that internal consistency checks are completed prior to the deposit. You have applied anonymization techniques as needed, and you have explored intruder testing. I've provided in there more information about how to um, conduct intruder testing, removing any temporary bit variables for survey data, be it notes for transcript data, for example, ensuring you use our recommended file formats for data and for documentation, and also transcription formats for qualitative textual data. If you are converting data across file formats, so say, for example, you have a, a SQL database, um, when you are sharing the data, you want to share it in SPSS or Stata or CSV, making sure that no data or internal metadata have been lost or changed during the process. Checking whether copyright permissions are um, applicable. Have I used data that's under copyright and I need to check before being able to share that data? Make sure you create and deposit a user guide that contains this key contextual information. So it includes why you have collected the data, how you have collected the data, what the population was in much more detail than in the metadata in the catalog. That's very high level. This includes um, much more information about the sampling, for example. Any issues with the data? Is there something in the data that secondary researchers should consider? So are there any limitations to the use of that data or key considerations? Making sure you create and deposit a readme file, and this is an index file that makes sure that all the data files that are included in the collections are very nicely organized and explained. This is, for example, survey data from 2021, and this is the questionnaire from 2021, and this is the survey data from 2022, and this is the questionnaire. Feel free to use our, our template. You can um, create your own readme file as well. As long as there's a readme file, that's most important. For data derived from existing resources, and we've seen we have people attending today that do create that type of data, making sure you have this variable log. Ideally, you want the variable log to be created from when you start working with the data, because the variable log should contain information about what type of data are you using, and most importantly, what access is that data available under. Because, for example, if you would be using safeguarded data from UK Data Service, under the end user license terms and conditions, you cannot simply just share that data for future reuse. You need permission from the original data creator. We are happy to negotiate permission with the original data creator. So if that is the case, do get in touch because we can help with that. Most of the times, however, sharing the code for reproducibility purposes very nicely commented and ensuring that you have the citation of the original data. It's also another way forward. So other recommended documentations, when we're talking about survey data, is fantastically useful if you can have a technical report. So for example, covering um, weighting in much more detail, how the weighting has been created, again, are there any limitations with that and so on. Making sure you have the questionnaires, have you used routing instructions, show cards, interviewing instructions, all of that is a all of that is documentation that is most helpful for secondary research. Coding frames and coding instructions as well. With the coding frames and the coding instructions, the main consideration is around copyright, so make sure you can share that information. Or if that information is copyright protected in the user guide, you can always include a link to the coding frames that you have used. For transcript data, making sure that the participant information sheet and the blank copies of the consent forms used are deposited alongside the data the topic guides and the interview schedules, and also a data list. And the data list is a finding guide. We have a, we have the um, template that I've linked in the slides. Um, and it includes key information on a transcript level to make sure that secondary researchers can make correct use of the data. Finally, just showing you, because we've looked at how we complete the offer form and deposit form and how we complete the, the reshare metadata, this is how that looks in our catalog. Um, so we're making sure, again, we're a, we're a um, 
domain specific repositories. So we use DDI, data documentation initiative, um, metadata. So we make sure that the information you're providing is then made available as DDI compliant information. Um, and the catalog metadata is the very first portal for secondary researchers to understand the data that's being made available to them and to see whether that's applicable for their own research. Now on to the, on to the benefits of depositing with UK Data Service. Um, there are no costs associated with the deposit. So when you're uploading the data, we are not charging you anything. Of course, that comes with the caveat that there are costs associated with preparing the data and documentation that should be taught from the beginning of the research. This is where a data management plan comes in to help. Um, we do have a separate, um, event on um, data management plans and research data management. So please make sure you have a look at that if you're interested in, in that. It is a fully online process. We ensure preservation and long-term access and we provide a robust license framework. We ensure improved data quality and standards um, by having these requirements in place and making sure that data is made available with documentation in um, proper um, formats. We provide resource discovery and citation. As we have seen in that catalog metadata information, we use digital object identifiers for citation purposes. So anyone accessing the link can go directly to the catalog metadata. We do promote all of our data collections to national and international research and research communities. We are part of the Consortium of European Social Science Archives and all of the data that is hosted with us the metadata is translated to the CEFTA data catalog for further discoverability. And we provide study level metrics for funding proposal or extensions. Um, for the curated collection, you need to get in touch with us and we can provide that for you for research that's available directly in the catalog record. Additionally, making sure that you actually adhere to the fair data principles because a lot of the fair data principles cannot be implemented unless you deposit in a responsible repository because you can have all the documentation, all the standard formatting. You still need to ensure, for example, that the metadata is a community endorsed metadata standard. So we're going back to the data documentation initiative. We make sure that we help you with compliance with funding in journal policies. So ESRC, for example, they mandate data sharing. But of course, more and more journals are mandating data sharing before accepting um, articles as well. It increases professional reputation and recognition, and it increases potential for new collaborations because you would have other researchers getting in touch with you saying, oh, I would like to build on your collection or maybe do a follow-up on your collection. Um, it also supports education, teachings, and skill development. A lot of our data users are um, students and lecturers using the data for educational purposes. Of course, overall, and this is applicable to any responsible repository, not just the UK data service, it is that contribution to scientific progress. You're making that data available. Um, and finally, we do provide data management guidance and support. Um, I can't say um, enough. Please do get in touch. Any questions you might have, we are here to, to help you with that. Um, so never hesitate to drop us an email. And again, we can sort out a Zoom, a Teams, um, or a phone call as needed to, to discuss or just communicate via email. That's, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, I've also included some additional resources, some tools that we've created at the UK Data Service. We have QA My Data, that's a numerical health check tool. Um, so you can use it for SPSS data and CSV files to check, do I have variable labels? Do I have any outliers? Um, we also have a qualitative anonymization helper tool. Um, it's just an MS Word macro and same as QA My Data, it does not apply any changes to the files. It simply flags where it found either capital letters or numbers. So things that are usually direct identifiers, names and addresses. And also I've put a link to Hasset, our um, thesaurus. If you want to have a, a further look into that, you can see all the different indexing terms. And they explain very nicely which one, what it means. Is there a broader concept that can be used, for example, um, and so on. Uh, do get in touch with us. Um, make sure you visit our website, join our Gmail group, 
Um, we are on X as well, and we do have a YouTube channel. This will be uploaded to YouTube as well. All of the all of the workshops and webinars are. Uh, thank you ever so much for all your attention. Um, I am I am most grateful for everyone that joined.